Hi, I'm Mara Webster with InCreative Company and thank you for joining us for one of our talks today. I'm so excited today to talk to the fantastic Helena York all about her HBO Max series, The Other Two. And the first thing I wanted to ask you about is obviously the first season you all jumped into this and started shooting incredibly fast. Um, and so going back and doing the second season, I was really interested in, in how you feel like your rhythm and dynamic with the rest of the cast has really evolved and, and how that shifted the way that you all work on scenes together and find a lot of the comedic moments? Um, I guess it's like anything, right? When you get to know people better, your rat-a-tat with them just sort of starts to sharpen. It's like you have a new friend and you're catching up on everything about them. And then once you get to know them better, you kind of know what makes each other laugh. And um, it just makes it a lot easier. And um, you just slip in very easily to you know, uh, being across from somebody that you you understand their beats and their rhythm and what they need from you at various moments. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I guess, and also to answer your question about the comedy, it's impossible because they just make me laugh all the time. So you'll ruin full takes all the time. <laughs> And you've mentioned before with the first season how Chris and Sarah, with a lot of their writing, that they really write so specifically to the actors and, and especially after shooting the pilot that you really kind of felt a tessellation with the dialogue that they were giving you and, and how you found that in your performance. Um, but have you found that, that they've done that even more so in the second season because now they've had the opportunity to really sit back and, and watch how you're inhabiting this character and watching how you're finding a lot of the emotional spaces within the comedy as well? Yeah, that's what was so flattering is that they wrote a season for me this year that um, kind of, uh, not kind of, it does explore every corner of, um, you know, uh, I guess my ability, which is so crazy to say, <laughs> um, uh, you know, to do physical comedy, small comedy, very big comedy, and then also moments that are grounded and real and sweet and, you know, sometimes romantic or anything like that. And to, you know, have the opportunity to do all of those things is so great, but it's also interesting to have a character tailored to you so closely. And those people also direct episodes and are around all the time. And so oftentimes the notes I'm getting on set are them being like, Hey, um, can you just do it the way I know you would say it? And you're like, yes, 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 I know what you mean. <laughs> so it's often notes of like, uh, do that face that you make that I like. And you're like, oh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. I know what you're talking about. So um, it's almost in many ways because they watch us and the edit so closely, I feel Chris and Sarah know me better than I know myself, <laughs> my own inflections, my own isms. Um, they've like perfectly captured, which is so, so, so cool. And such a dream as an actor to like work in that way. And because, you know, the comedy isn't afraid to go for the bigger moments, did you find that when you started the show that it was it was quite natural to feel out how far you could push the bigger moments of comedy? Or was it something that you kind of all played around with a little bit as cast together at the beginning? Um, we definitely play around with it. I often joke that if I had a nickel for every time I got told, like, Helena, please tone it down, um, I'd be a rich lady. <laughs> um, I'm always going to shoot for the moon and then they tailor me back and we find something true. And I think it's because of them I have a nice nuanced performance. Otherwise, maybe I'd be a screaming clown. I'm not sure. Um, so yeah, definitely finding balance with them. And they're so good at tracking where we are. We block shoot. So we'll be shooting episode one, five, and four in that order in a day. And um, just to figure out where you where you came from and where you are now, they're just um, amazing about keeping your head in that game and like tonally where you're at um, is difficult in a block shooting environment, for sure. But you were bringing up the nuance of, of the performance that this character really asks from you. And that's one of the things that makes it work so well. It's not a character who's going out there and making mean comedy and making fully selfish choices. Like we really understand the emotion, you know, even if it's, oh, I'm missing Real Housewives, we understand why that's a big thing. We understand that her seeing the new Hadid model is about self-validation and marries up to the fact that her life isn't where she thought it would be and this is going to be a moment where she feels like everything is okay and so you always kind of take those moments and then really bring it back to the emotional rooting of her in a character and and so just wanted to ask about how you kind of play around with that dynamic of very different beats within scenes as well um oh my gosh that's such a great question and thank you i'm glad that it um seems that way <laughs> um uh you know, I guess I would just compare it and I, and I 
I try to bring myself to everything that I do. I think it's impossible not to. Um, and that's just kind of my style is that so much of uh, life is hilarious and then serious simultaneously. And um, I think approaching material from a place that feels true to me is um, how I hope to make it read in a way that feels grounded. And, you know, while something insane might be happening, it feels like it's happening to a human being as opposed to a caricature. Um, and because I, I also think the fact that these things happen to a real person is is even funnier than if it was like a parody of a person. Does that make sense? Like, yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, I sometimes joke about how, like, you know, in life, like, um, something really horrible will happen to you and you'll say, maybe in retrospect, we'll laugh about this later. And like, that's their entire existence is like, hopefully laughing about something later. <laughs> because you were bringing up that idea of, of bringing parts of yourself in and it, it, you're right. It is every single character asks for different facets of yourself. Do you find that when you look at a character and when you work with scripts, that it's, it's quite natural to figure out what aspects of yourself you really want to bring into that character and and how much of it you want to as well or you know is it a bit of a discovery process as you find the character and and kind of marry those two sides together wow again an awesome question um i find that in working on material um just saying it out loud like the way i approach a scene is that if there's a scene with dialogue and we get everybody together and we just like hammer through the dialogue and i think in hammering through the dialogue you find places inside of your own voice that it lives in um and i do that with auditions as well uh just to feel like how is this person actually saying this what is the mental twists and turns they tie themselves in during the course of one scene um and yeah, I think, you know, I think I, I, I bring myself to things because I think my voice is my voice, my inflections, my inflection, and my isms are my isms. And, you know, nobody's gonna be better at those things than I am, those exact isms, that exact voice, instead of doing an impression of what I think somebody would be or do. Like, I always have the least successful time in auditions or in anything, doing what I think is like an impression of a feeling. It, that's what it always feels like I'm doing. It's like an impression of a feeling. So instead of like putting it on you is, is, is more um, interesting and, and more fun because it's, you know, uh, it, it feels like it's organic. Um, yeah. And I, yeah, I guess that is that, does that answer your question? I think it's also like, you know, I, I keep saying this, like the thing I, the idea of like doing an impression of something or of somebody else, it just, it's just never is successful. I don't think. Yeah. I also wanted to talk a little bit about your background in theater and, and how that really has informed a lot of your work in comedy, because there's, a, there's a very similar skill set to a degree in that a lot of it really is about reading the room, reading the energy in the moment, and also being able to pivot incredibly quickly to whatever it is you're responding to. And so do you find that in making a show like this, especially with the, the cast members that you're working with, when you're working with Wanda Sykes and Molly Shannon, who just are such quick fire comedians, that it kind of brings a lot of the skill sets that you developed in theater in that respect as well. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of thinking on your toes and being open to what somebody's bringing to you or how a, ch a scene changes or is different take to take, especially after you get like a note or something like that. Um, what I love about theater um, that you don't get as much in television is like the um, automatic audience response and being able to respond timing wise with that. Whereas in television, you can sometimes see like a cameraman's like shoulders bouncing up and down or sometimes like I'll hear Chris or Sarah like have a snicker off to the side, but it's not as rewarding as like a whole theater telling you what they, giving you a response. Um, Cause yeah, I mean, and I think that again, once, once material is in your voice and in your body in a way that feels true to you, you as a person are able to react to somebody else. And then a scene feels alive. And what's amazing about TV and film, I think anyway, what I loved about transitioning after doing theater is that you can kind of have fun with things knowing um, especially in this case, like that it's going to be edited and they're going to find the ways that it's going to cut together in a way. And I like to give them options a lot of times instead of like fitting into a thing, a, a rhythm the exact same way every time is sort of the idea that it's alive and that it can be many different things. Different things can happen. You can focus on a look or anything like that. And now watching the edit, it's cool to see parts that they pick, parts that they left aside. And like remembering what I did on the day is... Um, 
it's it's cool. It's a different, very different medium, I think. It is. And and separate to that, in terms of a lot of the details that you get early on in shooting a season on this show, um, you know, I know the first season that you you had the information and you knew about the passing of their father and, and what that comedic information actually was. Um, you know, when you get details like that, especially when you're block shooting and jumping around so much, I was thinking about how that must inform so much of the dynamic with Molly Shannon and what that parental relationship is. And did you find that with the second season that there were kind of any similar scopes in terms of the details that they gave you later on that really helped you in building a lot of the information and the groundwork in the first couple of episodes? Um, yeah, I mean, I we get all of the episodes ahead of time. So we read the entire season before we start shooting, which is really rare. Um, you know, I'm, I've been on shows where you're kind of waiting for the next episode while you're shooting the one before and you're not sure where the story is going or what's going to happen to the characters. And in many ways, I like that way of working because you're you're with a character that is experiencing things in real time as you experience them. But what I like about knowing what's coming is that you can kind of build an arc in your mind about where you're going. Um, so I honestly think that there's value to both. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's Brooke this season and season two, the journey for her is okay, she's finding success, she's good at something, but she starts to lose sight of what's important and um, seeing anything outside of herself. And um, uh, and there was this one story that they told me before we started shooting season two that I just love. And I, I really relate to this. And I think a lot of people would relate to this is Chris and Sarah were the head writers at SNL. I mean, that is the pinnacle of comedy writing, right? I mean, this massive job and it was this really incredible milestone in their careers and lives. And they were walking out of 30 rock on Saturday nights in the same t-shirt they'd been wearing for four days, like at 4 AM with nobody paying attention to them and only screaming for like Kate McKinnon. So that was sort of the idea that they brought to the season. And, um, I thought that was a really funny idea and, you know, just, um, you know, you're, you're constantly like moving this goalpost for yourself is like the theme of the season, which, um, that was really fun to play. Yeah. And I also, I really like in watching the episodes in this season that we do see Brooke developing more of a self-awareness and making more decisions for other people versus herself necessarily. And, you know, there's a moment where she's outside of an event and she really wants to go inside and she actually makes the choice to stay on a conference call when she could kind of drop the phone and go in and achieve the things that she wants for herself. And and if you found that the writing really naturally is giving you that sort of arc and, and are there details that you're kind of pulling into really enhance that journey for her as well. Yeah, I mean, I think what's fun about this show is that she could do that, but she doesn't. And it's infinitely more entertaining to watch her struggle through it and, you know, uh, what the result of that is. Um, you know, I think uh, what I love about playing a character like this as well is that she says things that you wish you would say to somebody out loud or, you um, you know, does things that you think are outrageous, like, oh, wouldn't it be funny if I did this? And she kind of does them. <laughs> um, and it's like almost living out a fantasy life, like to be that uninhibited and, you know, book dates as guests on your mom's show. Like, what would that be like? <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I think, you know, you're talking about like all the different layers and like pulling it into like who the character is. I, yeah, I think, I think what it is, is, um, thinking that something is going to be unbelievable and having expectations for something in your life to be unbelievable and having those expectations absolutely shattered is a truly universal concept. <laughs> um, you know, and I, I think it's, um, I think it's refreshing to, to see that in TV and it's certainly really fun to play it. <laughs> I also love the moment where she describes her outfits that she's wearing as her manager costumes. Yes. And, and you see a little bit of that is, you know, she's trying to project this idea and she's really trying to project this image of, of who it is that she wants to be professionally. Uh, yes. And so just wanted to ask about how the relationship with her manager costumes really helped with that arc. Um, yeah, I mean, it was, uh, it's a, that's a great joke written by Sarah Schneider. And, you know, I think us as actors and writers and stuff, we watch people like have real jobs and go to work in professional outfits. And like the idea that that'd be cosplay in some way that, you know, you're pretending to be this thing that you're not, or you don't see yourself as, and um, wanting to be taken seriously. And what I love about this character this season is that she sees herself as this like strong, independent businesswoman, and she can't, she, she can't quite identify 
um, fully within that. And it's not until it's like forced upon her that she realizes like, oh, I, I am this person. And, and like, I am important and people do respect me. And while she's just been sort of like saying it out loud, it, manifesting it without realizing that that's what she's doing. <laughs> she's like Oprah without realizing. And that's Brooke Dubeck, Oprah without realizing. <laughs> it's like such a bizarre parallel, sorry. <laughs> But I also really appreciate that she's incredibly dedicated to what she's doing. So even at the beginning of the season, when she's trying to look for the next Chase Dreams, that she's sitting in a coffee shop scrolling through TikTok, but we see that she's literally scrolled through every single possibility on TikTok. She's showing up at people's houses and she really is kind of doing everything that she knows how to do within her power to create that opportunity for herself. And is it important to you that even when she does have these missteps, that we still always see that element of like sheer determination and dedication that she brings to everything. Yeah. Um, yes. And, and I, I've been describing Brooke as somebody who jumps headfirst into a pool without checking to see if there's water in it first, just so just determined to be this person. And like, like on a fast moving train, um, Matt Rogers, who's a wonderful comedian who worked on writing the show calls the character strong, but wrong. Um, and, and I think that when you're in a position in life where you're kind of trying to make things happen to just throw yourself at them is, um, kind of the best you can do for me, myself personally, in this journey is, uh, in my own life and like trying to do this for a living, um, you know, the people around you are kind of killing it and have their life together. And I remember riding the subway one morning being like, wow, everybody on this car has health insurance and like a full set of pots and pans at home. And I like barely have a couch in an empty room and that's how I exist. Like it was so beyond me to feel settled in any way. Um, and I think that I've always thought as me myself, I've always thought like, oh, people have it together and I don't. And what's fun about reading Chris and Sarah's writing and reading this character is that I'm like, oh, nobody does. That's cool. <laughs> We're all just like, um, 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 so yeah. And do you feel like there's been more of an opportunity to really play around with her moral compass as well? Because there's there's that great scene in one of the episodes where she shows up at a kid's door and then she actually throws up because she has a physical response to thinking that she's outed a young kid to his parents. And so it does feel like, again, that, that there's a bit more development of her moral compass as well. Yeah, again, I think that go, goes to the strong but wrong. I once bought cards at bulk, like I like going into card shops and I bought several of these because I found one. I was like, oh, this is good. I should get a bunch of these. And it just said, um, I'm so sorry. I've been such an asshole. And it's like, if you're that kind of person that just goes so whole hog on things, you're going to fuck up because you're going to do things without thinking, um, without considering every aspect. And um yeah, that's what happens there, I think. <laughs> and in working with Drew Carver, who plays Carrie, your brother, your, uh, the other brother on the show of the other two, um, you know, there's there's been really interesting parallels between the two of them and the fact that they are always sitting a little bit out on the outskirts and there's a really lovely intimacy as well because they're both the only two people in the room that understand what it's like to be in that position. And also they both really are working hard to pursue things that they want. But in this season, there's a little bit more juxtaposition and it feels like Brooke's kind of taking off a little bit more than he is. And so did the two of you think or talk at all about how you thought that would shift in and alter the dynamic between the two of them just a little bit? Um, if anything, I think both of us, as the characters go on their merry journeys this season, what was so tough is that they, you know, they have such differing paths that we had less scenes together, which a lot of our scenes take place like over a phone call or, you know, every once in a while, the care two characters come together. Um, uh, and I, we, we missed that, but what is fun for us in that is like seeing now seeing what the other person was up to for the entire season has been, um, a joyous, like feeling like I'm discovering the episodes myself. Um, but no, I don't, we didn't really have a discussion about what that would do to like their journeys or anything like that. I think it was just something that naturally occurred and like the characters evolved as a result of it. So like while Brooke is having more success, he's having success in his personal life. So she thinks, and you sort of realize like, you know, your ship's passing in the night when you're not communicating or not connected with somebody, you don't actually really know what's going on with them. Um, so that disconnect, I think was what, what made the character journeys interesting this season.
And in the first season, it was so interesting to watch the way that, man, you know, working with her brother and, and then coming on board in his management team really shifted that dynamic a little bit and how it was still a really family based relationship with but also with kind of that sibling protectiveness as well. And then obviously now in this season, you're getting the opportunity to really explore what that dynamic does with her mom, Pat, who now has her own daytime TV show. And so how did you approach figuring out the way that that would inform their dynamic and, and shift some of it into that business space for the two of them? Um, you know, it's, um, I, I, I think what the show does really successfully and what a lot of people comment about it to us, which is great, is that one of the reasons people like it is that we're not shitty to each other in the show, that the family as a unit um, is really loving of one another. Um, and that carries through in the season. So while we're watching our brother become a superstar, our mom is, and I think that there's just this assumption by both Carrie and Brooke that like, oh, they're killing it, they're fine. They don't, you know, need us. Like we can, we're worried about our own thing. Like, you know, and, and, and forgetting that, you know, family is, is you know, is the central most Im uh, important part of who we are and like in this show in particular. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, I think that that's like the overwhelming um, tone element of the show that makes it really work is that it's not about clawing, it's not about jealousy, it's not about like animosity in any way. Yeah. And it, it, it's also really fun to watch a lot of the scenes where Molly Shannon now has a national stage in which to embarrass her children. And she's doing all of the things that she did before, but her FaceTiming her kids onto her television show obviously is a totally different space. And, and is there kind of like an intentional teenage regression almost that, that you kind of look at as that dynamic? Because it really is that whole, oh, my mom's embarrassing me, but now so many more people know that she's doing this. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, again, I think that's just such a great, perfect joke written by Chris and Sarah, that if your mom had a talk show, she would FaceTime you in the middle of it. Um, you know, everything about the talk show element of the show this season was so, so, so well done. And it, to the point where I, I remember watching it while we were shooting it being like, why doesn't Molly Shannon have a talk show? Why wouldn't anybody's mom from the Midwest have a talk show and like be able to obviously connect with people? Um, so yeah, I mean, I think all of the, all of the daytime talk show jokes that are written into the show this year are just like perfect <laughs> so so brilliantly done um and you know now that you now that you've done two seasons of the show and and had an opportunity to develop such a relationship with this character what are the things that you feel like you've had the opportunity to learn from playing Brooke in the show um I think I think what I've I think what I've learned like as an actor through the experience of doing it is um is, is that just as I said, is that this is a character that was written for me in my voice and um, to not second guess every last thing that I do. I think that that's um, something that hamstrings actors all the time is like thinking of every beat and every moment and every motivation behind everything. And I think it's way less complicated than we give it credit for. I'm not saying that acting isn't hard and that, you know, I'm sure playing Mare in Mare of East Town was a very nuanced experience for Kate Winslet. Um, but, you know, I think, I, I think, you know, being with a character for a long time is, is, you know, really nice. You can, it steps into shoes that you're used to fitting pretty seamlessly in. And, you know, when I was shooting the pilot, I was like, so positive that I didn't belong there, that I was like going to be fired. They would recast me and shoot the series with like a different actress. Like that was the cloud I was living under. Um, so I think a lot of confidence is what I've taken from the experience generally. Yeah. Well, the first season was so great and I'm so glad that we finally got a second season and it's it's really phenomenal what you've all done, both on a comedic space, but also the emotional beats of the show. So congratulations on that and thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. That's really nice.